Well, my name is uh, Joan Benac. I am professor of sociology in La Pompeu Fabra University. Um, I study medicine and then public health. And I'm going to answer three of the important questions that have been asked to reflect on in the next few minutes. The first question is why health systems are so important to guarantee the right to health? Well, I think that um, the achievement of good health is, of course, a very important goal for almost everybody. It's very important to reduce premature mortality, to reduce morbidity, to feel good, to reduce pain, to reduce suffering, all the things that human beings need. Also, healthcare is important for the reduction of health inequalities. Remember that healthcare is just one of the many social determinants of health. There are many social determinants of health. Healthcare is the one in which the people who suffer, who are ill, who have some problems, in the end need some kind of care, some kind of care, healthcare or social care. Now, important needs to be covered uh, when we are talking about health systems. So I'm going to mention several key factors. The first one is, of course, coverage, access, and quality. We need uh, human engagement, we need uh, democratic treatment, and we need a uh, balanced measure of technology. Remember that today, maybe half of the world do not have access to essential treatments, where, where on the other side, uh, there are many people who are suffering from what doctors call iatrogenia, meaning, for example, that in countries such as the US, today the bad practice, the ill practice of health and healthcare is the third cause of deaths in the country. Now, another thing that we need when we are talking about health systems is that these systems need to be centered on sick persons, not just on fragmented diseases. So we need to treat people. We don't need to treat, uh, you know, under the biomedical discourse, we don't have to treat just diseases. Another key point is, of course, that healthcare and social care, I cannot forget the integration of healthcare and social care, is a very important asset for the achievement of equity, right? So health for all means that we need healthcare and social care for all. And finally, another point I want to mention is the need for integration. We need to integrate the health care in which primary care, social care are the most important pillars of the system, needs to be integrated with the social determinants of health and with the public health systems. And sometimes in Spain, in many countries, people confuse uh, the concept of public health care and public health. And of course, public health is such a different thing. So that would be the, the first point I want to mention. Now, unfortunately, in the, in the last 40 years, under the waves of neoliberalism, we are suffering uh, an attack to public health care and social health care. And there are many strategies that neoliberalism have been introduced, have been expanded in so many countries. It's uh, under the pressure of what it's called a biomedical pharmaceutical complex. There are many types of uh, strategies, as I'm saying. There are issues reg regarding the change of laws, for example, in terms of private management. You know, in many hospitals, we, we know that many of the directors or the managers of hospitals are economists that have a very strong view of neoliberal ideology. Another tactic is outsourcing and subcontracting. So this has been very, very common in the last decades. And of course, the public-private partnerships that in, in which today we, we see that the public and the private is blurred. There is no a clear cut between one and the other. And of course, and a final strategy is of course propaganda. So the ideology, meaning that the private is more efficient, more rational, all these kind of things. Okay, so that's what I want to say about this uh, first point. And I'm going to move to the second question. The second question is what are the worst problems of health systems to achieve the goal of health for all? 
Well, of course, the first thing, the first quick thing I have to say is the uncovered needs that unfortunately millions and millions of people, maybe half of the world's population, that means 4,000 million people, an enormous amount of people who do not have access to the essential basic services. But the worst problems I would suggest are two. The one, of course, is privatization and commodification I referred before. So under, the, under neoliberal, neoliberalism, there has been these movements towards to get the money. So it's not as important if the system is so, it's called public or it's called private, but the key point here is where the money goes. And as, I'm said, as I said, there are many means, many tactics to achieve that. And the second big point is the model. The model is very important. Why is that important? Because we could theoretically have a 100% public system and still be a bad system. So we need a system that is well-funded, not like today we see in so many countries, a precarized system in which we see the precarization of so many health workers, nurses, doctors, we see in many third world countries, what it's called the brain drain. So the most, uh, you know, intelligent, committed people and, and healthcare workers go to another country to work because in their own country, they don't have enough resources and enough places to work in properly. Another key element in this failing model that we need to change is unfairness and inequality. So, of course, the system needs to be fair and equal. So everybody needs to have access and the coverage, but also the quality to have good health and social care. Another key point that we need to change is the medicalization of the system. So today we are experiencing a model in which basically we most of the funding, most of the resources go to hospital, goes to high tech, goes to expend expensive treatments, goes to surgery and so on. So while in fact the center of the system, the core of the system, both in health and social should be primary care, should be social determinants of health and should be public health. And another, another and final point we need to change is the lack of democracy. Many of the actions, many of the, um, the actions that are taking in many places are not democratic at all. So we experience this kind of opacity where that we, many of the procedures, many of the managerial things that are, and the decisions are taking in hospitals in many, in many places do not count with the population. Okay, so now I'm going to move to the final question. And the final question is uh, the need of another health system model under COVID-19 or the post-COVID-19 era, era, if we, we can call it that way. And the first thing I have to say is that there are a number of trends that we have to be aware, trends that are really very important because this is what's going to happen in, in right now, but also in the next few years. So we are experiencing already, of course, a crisis of inequality and a, and a crisis of care. So inequality has been growing dramatically for the last 40 years in so many countries, between countries, but also in mainly within countries. And this last year under COVID-19, we have been experiencing, experiencing even a further increase of these inequalities. And of course, the crisis of care in which basically women are supporting, have the burden, the heavy load of working in the house, out of the house. So this is something very important when we are thinking in care and social care. Another, of course, trend is commodification. Under neoliberalism, it is, uh, it is not introduced also, but it is developed what it's called the corporate welfare. So the idea is to the attack or the attempt to destroy the welfare system, welfare state system that many countries still have and many other, unfortunately, many other countries do not have. But it is the idea to put a corporate welfare instead of the welfare system. Now, what's going to happen in the next few years? Now, two 
things, two trends that are a little bit different, but in the end collapse in the same point. One is the medical revolution that we are beginning to experience. And certainly that the medical industrial complex are trying to develop this idea so that in the end, it looks like that we are going to have our doctor in our house through technological means and in our pocket with uh, e cell phones and all kinds of devices. That means this is what is behind what it's called sometimes e-health or the 5G revolution or the artificial intelligence and the robotization and the big data and all these kind of things. So we have to be very aware of that because if we don't, if we don't prevent that, this is going to be sold, is going to be introduced, and many people are going to buy, let's say, this idea, and many people are going to fall under this kind of uh, frame. But this medical revolution, it is also connected with a big ecological crisis. This ecological crisis not only means the climate emergency that, fortunately enough, in the last few years, most people are knowing, but also a very important point, which is not only the new pandemics aside COVID-19, but also the crisis of energy. We are going to experience in the next few years a big crisis of energy. There is no way, there is no way that through the new energy alternatives, this can supplement or this can uh, be used instead of what is basically the blood of today's system, which is basically oil. So we are going to experience that. So according to many studies, and that means that, for example, this trend I just described in few words, this medical revolution or high tech revolution is going to face in front with the wall of the lack of energy. So that means that probably hospitals are going to have a problem here in terms of energy. We cannot spend all kinds of, you know, few amounts of energy using all kinds of technological devices. Okay, so what do we need? We need many things, of course. We need uh, a fair model. We need an integrated new model of health care and social care in which promotion of health, not just disease, not just the treatment of disease is very important. Of course, prevention of disease is important. The surveillance is important. The treatment, the primary care, the social care, and so on and so forth. Now, we have also to be aware of the big data system and the possibility that, for example, historians such as Hubert Harari has raised often in, in his books and his talks when he, he says that there is the possibility that in the future, new companies take advantage of the biomedical data that we have so that in the end, maybe they are going to know us much better than we know ourselves or we know or our mother knows our, you know, ourselves. Now, what can we do here? Well, of course, the task is huge. We have not to be disappointed under that. The task is in any case huge. And in my view, the only way is to put basically a lot of pressure on governments. We need to use, we need to take advantage of the governments that are more in favor of the public health systems. But again, I have to insist, we need to change the model. And certainly social movements needs to be aware of all these trends and needs to be grouped and needs to be put together to put all these pressures in terms of decommodification, demedicalization, democratization, and humanization of healthcare and social care. Thank you.